Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, little video that we're going to be putting out. So my name's Neil, I'm from the Avanti ISO Way sports cycling team and uh, we've got here the Tour of Taiwan but uh, joining me here in the studio is Matt Tooley who is, how would you describe yourself Matt? Enthusiast? Racer? Yeah, a cycling enthusiast Neil is probably pretty good. An enthusiast who's actually got a bit more into racing. Um, but anyway, we're going to just watch this footage here of stage four of Tour of Taiwan and uh, yeah, just sort of run you through what's happening and, and give people a bit of an inside look into the into the race. So a bit of context um, in the tour, in terms of the tour, we've got Ben there in the yellow jersey. To the left of him is uh, Robbie Hucker, another climber. So Ben from Western Australia, young climber. Got yellow in the first stage in a breakaway. Robbie Hucker, another climber. Um, I've just moved past number 32, which was Chris Hamilton. He's a uh, young uh, kid also from Bendigo, and he's been going extremely well this year too. He, he did really well. He won the under-23 national champs, went to TDU and did really well, um, finished right up there. Then we've got myself, Neil Vanderplug, sprinter, uh, and then we've got Anthony Giacoppo, who's another sprinter who's been climbing really well. So teams of five here, Matt. It's a bit smaller than normal. So does that make it a little bit harder to control things, Neil? Yeah, absolutely. So if you had nine people, you could have, you know, you could protect all of the climbers. Say you've got four climbers, you've still got five guys to ride things back. But with five-man teams, uh, we've currently got pretty much everyone still up on GC. So um, if you want to, say, keep a sprinter for the stage, but you also want to keep a few of your GC guys fresh, you know, that might leave you only one perhaps two guys to do the riding at the front so it makes the racing a lot more open um, in this tour although we're holding yellow it's really tight uh, we it's purely just um, the one break on day one that's really shaken up the GC that's how Ben got there he just landed the move he's got a minute on most of the field and there's quite a few other guys on this basically the same time as him that's uh, Francesco Mansebo who's just passed us there. He's um, ex-Spanish national champ. That's the Skydive Dubai team. You see a fair bit of those guys in this race. Uh, and also United Healthcare from America. They're on the front at the moment. So they're, they're, tr they're tr trying to control it for their Italian guy, Canola, who's a bit of a sprinter all-rounder. So he's been in the lead up to this day. He's won a lot of the bunch kicks, but it's been the, it's been the tour of opportunistic moves. They've almost always stayed away. So this Canola guy has won two bunch sprints in the last two stages. So they're absolutely throwing everything at this stage because this is the last chance. Tomorrow there's a mountaintop finish and they've proven that this guy can get the job done. He's a reasonable chance anyway, enough for them to really commit to it. So although we've been in yellow, we haven't had to do that much. So you can just see here just um, all these little bits and pieces around. So bottom left, the red is power. We've got speed and cadence bottom right we got gradient so you can see this is the last bit of a, a kicker this is the the last bit of the KOM and then up the top right we're going around the uh, sun moon lake I was going to say Neil it looked like you've been pushing a fair bit of watts for the last little while was it pretty yeah, hard for you so at this point doing over 500 there yeah like that was a bit of a uh, steeper pinch in the climb and being a bit of a heavier rider um when, when those pinches happen, I have to put out a lot of power and be pretty anaerobic um, to sort of even stay. And you can see I actually slip back a few positions, so that's um, that's commonly what you sort of do if you want to save your legs. But it's it's not so much um, it's not, not always just choice when when the pinches go up like that. I'll usually drift back a bit as the climbers sort of go forward because you know they don't have to do as much power to. Uh, to sort of accelerate off, it's all about power to weight. Well, so you I can suppose see. it's a good tactic to start at the front and sag back then for someone like yourself? Yep, that's exactly why I went. You could hear a bit of yelling. I actually said, come on, corner, let's move up. And the other guys, I don't think they were too stressed. I think I think you heard Robbie, he just yelled out, no, nah, just stay here. And I was like, like hell. And you can see like I'm slipping quite a bit further back than them. Uh, and this climb, just to put it in context, this is the top of the KOM. Oh, you can see the Sun Moon Lake on the left there. Beautiful. Um, but this climb was a about a 40 minute climb and I think we averaged about oh, I'll just get it up, I've got some stats here but it was about a 340 watt average something like that, so it was fairly solid but um, 
yeah, it had a few flatter bits as we sort of started the footage. It was flatter. Now it's kicking up right towards the end. This last kick, just to give you a bit of an idea of the average, I think we averaged about 415 up this last sort of five minutes of the of the climb. And as you can see, 600 watts there, like it's surging. It's not at all like um, how you'd normally ride in training unless you're really inconsistent. And does that do you find that um, is harder to ride that sort of surgy tempo rather than just sitting on a um, uh, standard wattage? Yeah, I think it, that that probably partly depends on what type of a ride you are. But personally, and, I, and generally, yeah, like if you if you have to sort of like go really hard, back it off really hard again, you're probably going to be more efficient um, going easier. Which is why sort of sagging back through the bunch can also sort of save your legs for that final sprint. So that was the top there. So now we're going to head down a bit of a descent, and that sort of um, loop around the lake there. It's a bit undulating, so there's going to be a few little rises and descents in there. And as you can see, it's been wet too, so that's why it's sort of so strung out. Twisty roads and wet. Recipe for just, you know, single line. And when um, there's variable conditions on the road surface like this, Neil, does that um, increase the stress that happens in the bunch? Yeah, definitely. So a lot of people are just more nervous in the wet. And for good reason like it's it's more slippery and it's probably a bit more unpredictable sort of traction too you can see there's a lot of moss on the left there and towards the edges there's some leaves and things like that and every now and then you hit that on a climb and you just spin out so like you can imagine on a descent if you go too close to that you can just you know flip out Trav Meyer I went past him at one point during the day and I remember he yelled out at me and I think uh, yeah he thought it was a bit you know unnecessary I was trying to move up after probably losing some spots on the climb and yeah so people are definitely like you know rightfully a bit um a bit more on edge but it means yeah it's it's interesting because there's a lot more chance to move up because there's there's probably a bit of i reckon there's probably a bit of over caution in the wet sometimes so it means you know if, you, if you're confident in the wet which i tend to be also have a few crashes but like if you can sort of um ride the conditions well you can still be conservative enough not to crash and you can sort of make up a fair bit of ground on people, so it's pretty handy. But uh, yeah, you can see it's sort of in a weird spot. It's not like teeming down with rain, but it's um, a bit of water on the lens there. It's sort of half drying out here. Yeah, and we, at this point, we've actually got one guy, Anthony Giacoppo. He's, he's been going real Whoa, good. Oh, yeah. guys running wide. Yep, a bit wide there. And that's the other thing. We, none of these riders know this terrain at all. So it'd be, it'd be totally different if we were doing circuits of this because people would get a bit of a feel for it and you'd know how fast you can sort of hit the corners. But this is sort of, it's first time, it's wet, it's, it's, uh, it's tricky and you do see a fair bit of that, people just bailing and going wide. Do you tend to just follow the guy in front of you and hope he sort of makes the right call or are you sort of looking ahead and trying to pick your own lines? Oh, you do a bit of a mixture of both, but... Often at this point, I'm usually trying to, like you can see there, I'm sort of looking for that sort of inside line to make a position. Made one there, I'm looking for it on the outside here. But you've got to be careful because you don't want to just... If you're going past too fast and too close, you can sort of, you know, you can cause a bit of damage. So you sort of want to just pick and choose. And the other thing is like, yeah, you need to sort of... It's just like any part of a bike race. Like if, you, if you're going to move up, you can just barrel straight up and you'll probably use more energy as well but like do you really need to at that moment like you sort of have to you know weigh it up is it worth the risk to sort of get to the front now or is is it just fine just to follow down and it is harder back here you can see sort of sprinting out of the corners like well over 700 watts there that's sort of elastic band effect yeah you get more of that back here um but uh yeah you don't want to just you can't get into too sort of gung-ho, I guess. And at this point, we're actually, we've got radios in, which is the first time uh, in quite a few years at this level. So it's been allowed at the World Tour level, but all of the other races underneath you haven't been allowed to use race radios until January the 1st. So we've got a radio now. So um, at this point in the race, we were getting word that um, Jay Coppo, who we were sort of working for at the finish, he was having a bit of trouble on these wet and slippery descents and losing contact. So at this point here, we could hear Andrew Christy Johnson, the director in the team car, giving a lot of encouragement. 
trying to G up AJ to sort of get back on and, you know, telling him stuff like, come on, it's it's drying out. Like, just, you know, forget about the wet. It's drying out. You've got this. Like, you know, this is this is your stage. Like, just trying to just get him motivated and that sort of thing um, and just encouraging him. And then also telling us, you know, making us aware, look, AJ's off the back. Just follow into the moves. Don't be the aggressors. So don't chase because there's actually one guy who's off the front now as well um marco's not italian from park hotel valkenberg so he's really capitalized on this twisty sort of run in um and he's away solo and it's it's good terrain to be solo because you can you can't see in front at all it's just too twisty so you know people can be sort of a bit out of sight out of sight out of mind sometimes yeah yep that's exactly right so we were actually told at this point don't chase the guy back until AJ gets to us, gives us the okay, and then um, quite potentially that would be my role or, or one of the other guys probably as well if, if, if they can sort of do a turn and still stay in in the bunch. Um, yeah. Now, it doesn't really look like much of a bunch. It looks pretty sort of strung out, this whole sort of um, undulating section we're looking at. Yep. It's probably a bunch of 40 here. Um, I don't usually, I don't think I'll get too much further back than where we are now. But yeah, it's so twisty that it's very, um, you know, it, it just strings it out as you go around the corners. You're not going to go around sort of six people wide, so it just tends to be strung out, and then it never or doesn't allow much bunching up. So yeah, it's a bit of an interesting finish. It, it creates a lot more opportunity for guys like Zanotti, who is off the front at the moment to uh, launch and it makes it a bit more of an open race harder to control because you can imagine if someone attacks from the front because it's strung out in a single line there's only a couple of people who can respond and there's quite a few people like AJ at the moment you probably can't even see that there's a move going so it's um, it's pretty valuable to have guys like Robbie there number 33 on the right and uh, there Chris Hamilton both ex-mountain bikers they love this sort of stuff they revel in it so they're always able to hold good position and respond to things like that. So that's why um, yeah, it's really valuable to have you know those sort of skills. Sort of makes for interesting racing too, I suppose. Like yep. keep you know keep on the ball and watch what's going on. Yeah, I really like this type of finish. It is. It's you can see the power is pretty low there, but it's up and down like a yo-yo through here. It's been up and down the whole time. Yeah, and I've got um, I've got some more stats here for the last 25 minutes. So of the footage that we've seen, um, there we go. So it was average power of 310 watts. And that's me at sort of like, you know, 77 kilos, 78, somewhere around there. And normalized power of 350. So normalized power, a lot of people get that wrong. That's, it's not with zeros taken out. It's sort of, um, it's the physiological sort of constant load that you would have to do. Um, so it means if it's 350 normalised, it means it's been very up and down power, as you can sort of observe on the left. And if you were to do that effort, um, or this same effort at a constant power, it would be like doing 350 watts constant. So that makes sense. Yeah, it's pretty, um, it's pretty, pretty tough. That's Chris Hamilton there. And so in most races, you'd find a bit more of a discrepancy between average and normalised power compared to training the... Yeah, look, obviously depending on how you train, but like... Just think, dealing with the surges and stuff. Yep, yeah, unless you're sort of surging... Oh, there we go, having a drink. Unless you're sort of surging a lot in training, you tend to be have... Yeah, the, the gap between that normalised power and the average power would be quite small. Unless you're doing like efforts or something like that, or there's little hills that you're sort of punching up and over, but... Yeah, racing tends to be really on off, as you can see. Just it's a lot of um, yeah on the pedals, off the pedals, particularly in this sort of terrain here. Pretty nice. It's nice scenery. I didn't, scenery, re I didn't really notice it when I was racing. Yeah, it's quite nice. There you go, 10k to go. So it's kind of like a rainforest you're racing through. Yeah, yep. Yeah, it's pretty beautiful this part of Taiwan, but the air can just be so so thick. Humid. Just no, no I sort of meant uh, thick with sort of pollution. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, like, that's the only sort of problem with it. But up here, it doesn't look too bad. So, at the front, at this point, we've got a few moves going off the front. And we've got um, Robbie Hucker right at the moment. Uh, yep, 
I'll have to bleep that out, but we've got Robbie in a move, and I've just sort of seen Ben in the yellow jersey on the front of the peloton just driving it, which is, um, you know, he, he, he hopped really off pretty quick. Yeah, no, he hopped off pretty quick because um, he, he may not have even realised that Robbie was up there. Um, but that's sort of the, the thing with having the yellow jersey, I suppose. You, Robbie can be in there and just sit on the move because, you know, there's no real... Um, as far as the team's concerned, there's no benefit in him driving that brake because, worst case scenario, the brake comes back and we've got the yellow jersey still. So it's a good situation and it's definitely not one that Ben needs to be bringing back. <laughs> so, well, yeah. I think the expletive was probably justified then, Neil. Yeah, look, that's arguable, but, yeah, you can understand. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, we've got UHC still on the front bringing it together. So they've really, like, we heard them talking on the bus after the last stage, and they were highly motivated. They were they were really confident they could get the job done. So they're, they're doing a hell of a lot of work here in this last, uh, this last sort of 15K. Yeah, so this is stage four, so the second last stage. And... Um, yeah, at this point, this Zanotti guy's got about 15 seconds. Uh, and because the GC you were explaining is so close, that sort of gives your team sort of multiple options. As far as GC and the stage, you can sort of look at some of your climbers like Robbie or Ben yep. to hold on to it. Yep, definitely. And like this this terrain as well, Like we had a pretty open plan. So Andrew, um, like I certainly wasn't expecting to be here. Uh, at this point because it looked very hilly um, but he sort of gave a pretty free reign to a few of these guys to sort of follow into things and you know if opportunity presented in this last bit you know people could sort of roll the dice but you sort of don't want to go too hard say you're in a group of 10 you know there's no point driving that break and then getting a pretty average result um, and then you know GC you haven't really changed much like you've got you know you might have changed it a little bit. It might not be Ben in the yellow, but you might be sort of sitting in fifth or something. So, And with AJ kind of sort of get, trying to get back on, were you starting to think, oh, I might have to do something here? Well, I was hoping that AJ would get back on, but I've got on this 62, that's Andre Polini. He's a sprinter from Skydive Dubai. Like, I was sort of starting to get into the mode of, um, you know, and I think Andrew said over the radio, he said, look, Vandy, you may have to sprint on this one, just... You know, AJ's getting back on, but like, as you can see, it's strung out. It's not, there's not a lot of opportunity to move up. So I was sort of, you know, in, in sort of um, preparing myself to sort of go for the sprint, which you sort of have to do. You have to put yourself in that mindset. But, you know, also just waiting for the call from AJ. Um, yeah, just waiting for the call. So I was kind of just preparing for either scenario, really. And, and here with the radio, it's easy to talk to each other. Yeah, they can be a real, a real, like, you know, just a hazard. You can hear me trying to work out what's going on here. I was trying to talk to um, Ben there about the last corner and the distance from the last corner to the finish because I didn't even look at it in the race book. Normally you look over that stuff, particularly if you're a sprinter and you think you're going to be there. You look after, you, know, you look at it in great detail. You know the finish. You know what side of the road you want to be coming in on. You know, you know it quite well. You even get Google Maps up. You check it right out. But, like, I'd written it off because the climbs look far too hard. So I was trying to <laughs> just get a bit of info there. Um, exactly the distance from that corner of the finish line. Um, yeah, and I'm also trying to work out what's going on. As you, Yeah, how many off the front? Because it wasn't super clear. You can't, you never get a visual. Well, it's a good um, example of sort of how difficult difficult it is to um, find out what's actually going on in a big bunch like this now. Yeah, and it used to be a lot harder. It's, it changes the game a fair bit with the race radios. In some ways, I liked not having the race radios because it meant, you know, it was a bit more sort of... Yeah, in, in some ways, you just... Well, a bit more pure. Yeah, well, sometimes, like, I guess it can be annoying. Like, <laughs> we could have just finished the stage and not known there was a guy off the front. Um, but at the same time, it means that you sort of have to sort of do more communication just on the road. You have to just ride up next to the guy and say, hey, what's going on? Did you see that? No, I didn't see it. And you're like, oh, crap, maybe we'll send someone back to the car. So you send someone back to the car and they actually talk with the manager if he's there. But the radio, it does change it a bit. There's a lot more information coming straight away if the radios work. But we just got new radios before this tour, so it works well. 
It looks like you're coming into town here now. Yeah, a little bit more of a descent. Just trying to follow Polini here. It's drying out a bit. And yeah, this oh, corner sharp runs right, right up. There. So I just sort of... No point following him over there, Neil. Nah, you, nah, you want to follow him, but, uh, you know, not into the lake. <laughs> and what's his background? Polini? Mm. No, I think he's been going cycling for a fair while. I think he's formerly on... Uh, he was in World Tour for a qu quite a while. Um, I think he was on Lamprey for most of his career. And uh, now he's... He's doing pretty well this year. He was at the Tour of Lankawi with a few, quite a few other World Tour teams. And I, I saw he definitely won one stage and was up there on a few. He might have even got a couple, I don't know. But he's definitely, that's what, sort of why I was pretty happy with him at this point. I knew he had good form. He's, he's a sprinter who's been around quite a while. He races in Asia frequently now. So, like, he knows a lot of these riders. And I was pretty confident that if I stayed on his wheel... It's a fairly good bet. And we're also just in, in good position. So I thought this was a good wheel to be on for the moment. So well, that sounds fair we'll enough. Just be here, yeah. And later on, I think you see us go past Robbie. And Robbie sort of recognises that. He's like, yep, Neil's on a pretty good wheel. I'll sit on Neil's wheel. So he sat on my wheel to sort of protect that a little bit. Um, just to create a bit of distance between... Makes it harder for someone to sort of chop you. Yeah, that's it. If they want to move up and grab the wheel off me, they've got to um, they've got to go past Robbie first as well. It just makes it that bit harder. Ideally, you have your whole team lined up there. He's a bit of an enforcer. Yeah, that's it. He's the... Uh, what do they call him in Quidditch? Oh. The guys with the batons? I can't remember. Yeah, but he's one of them. I know what you're talking about. A me. bludger? No, they're the, they're the actual things you hit. <laughs> a beater? Anyway... So you can also see... Um, there's, I'm just scared of the Death Eaters now. <laughs> yeah. You can just see there a Skydive Dubai rider just swapping off to do another turn. So Polini or the director has made the call that um, it's you know worth chasing this guy down. We've got a sprinter here who could easily get the job done. So now they've got two GC riders who are going to pitch in. Um, they're not going to just end it or 4K to go. So they're not just going to completely do a peel. They're just going to do enough to sort of... They're going to do as much as they can without getting dropped. Um, but there's two riders there from Skydive Dubai. UHC is still sort of giving what they can. And I think there's an Illuminate rider, the team that's in Pure Black, another team from the States. They're all trying to bring this Zanotti back, and he's just dangling in about 15 seconds. It's a very good ride from him, really. Yeah, top ride, top ride. And, um, yeah, and, and at this point, we're still sort of like, you know, we're sort of, we could sort of lend a bit of a hand to Chase, but... Um, yeah, at this point we probably could have, but um, we still hadn't seen AJ. So if, if one of us goes on the front and keeps more pressure down, that may just make it a bit harder for him to move up and find us. So until we had AJ here, we were just basically just, you know, preparing for the finish and not really pushing the envelope at all. And so how far from the finish do you reckon we are here now? Uh, I think we're just under 4K, I think I saw. Yep. <coughs> so we're starting to get to that real pointy end, like... Um, as you can see, yeah, UHC worker coming back up to do as much as he can. There you go, 3K to go. So Polini's giving him a push on the back because at this point in the race, a UHC domestique is as good to Polini as his own teammates. Like, they're all the same. They're all doing the same thing here. They're trying to just bring it back so he can have a dig. So you see Polini sort of, you know, be a bit of a gentleman to a few guys there. It's, uh, Jeez, don't be a, fooled. He's geez, not a gentleman. A <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's not a gentleman. It's just... Uh, yeah, you just, it's, it's quite a good selfish, thing for really. Yeah, <laughs> it's a fragile alliance. There's a lot of fragile sort of alliances that are uh, forged and broken out there. That's bike racing. Man. That is bike racing, absolutely. So yeah, it's a funny sport like that. You've yeah, a lot of changing sort of dynamics between teams. Keeps it interesting though. Here we got the pesky Illuminate riders. Looks like he's trying to be pesky and yeah, steal that wheel. There's a bit of a here. battle going on for the wheel here. You can hear a bit of yelling. Is that you yelling? Oh, I couldn't tell you at that point. It could have been. Ooh, and there you go. Oh, another helper potentially. Let's give him a push. <laughs> Let's give him that. Yeah, up there, mate. <laughs> 2K to go. So we're getting right towards the business end, and you can see here there's quite a jostle for this position. So the Illuminate guys, they've got good numbers at the Gee, moment. There's still plenty of corners. Yeah. I've got Robbie Hucker on my wheel here too. You can start to hear quite a bit of yelling. People are starting to sort of move up. Within 2K, there's not a lot of time here. 
He's conceding that one. You actually hear a bit of a zip there. There's a bit of a touch of wheels, which is not massively uncommon. Not a great sound, though, Neil. See there, that's that's a bit shitty, isn't it? <laughs> I've got the... Uh, I don't know if it... Well, let's call him Scandinavian. Swedish or Norwegian, should know. He's moved up on the left there, and at the same time, we've had a UHC right appeal to the left, and that's just clogged that left side up. And then I've just I've just been, boom, shuffled, just, just like that. Just, just touched your brakes. Yeah, it was just a bit of an unfortunate sort of, you know, two events. You know, it just happened at a bad time. So I'm just moving my way back up now. But you can see that's that's the uh, UHC sprinter there. So they've actually run out of firepower, and we're just about to hit 1K to go. And there's been an ease up in the bunch. Oh. And then, boom, Ooh. Will Clark is gone. So Will Clark just... That is a serious move. Yeah, he's, he was actually sitting at the back and then uh, just launched as the bunch slowed, textbook. And then you can see there, I just got, yeah, a bit unfortunate again, just oh, oh. crash on the right, yeah. So I was just kind of, yeah, I just had to put the brakes on when uh, the UHC guy swerved left. I was overlapping the wheel a little bit of the that was pretty Scandinavian. Bad yeah, and then you can see in these sort of sprints, I've, I was at the front, lost a bit of momentum, applied the brakes just as people were coming from behind, and it's all over. I'm like way out of it and it's less than a k to go so and that was if you if you look again like you can see aj back there so that was the first time i've actually seen aj so unfortunately we never really got together to you know do anything as a team jeez there's a few there. corners in this finish neil yeah it's it's uh it's a pretty ridiculous finish <laughs> <laughs> like it is just you can hear i almost put someone into the fence there and he just yelled out at me so hectic finish well wow. look as soon as i got swamped there i sort of thought yeah that's it so i sort of rather than trying to you know do a kamikaze and and risk anything i just maybe i should have fought on a bit but i sort of thought no nah, that's it when you're in 30th place 1k to go it's uh it's pretty much all over and the stage there was won by will clark so that flyer that he took he actually he went past the the rider who was solo off the front with, I don't know, 500, 300 to go. That's a good move. Took the win. And then the guy off the front, um, Zanotti, actually held on for a podium. Um, AJ went alongside him and got squeezed out on one of those little corners. So AJ got as far as second place, squeezed out, and then rolled fourth in the end. So He's done quite well, really, in the end, AJ. He has. He, was, he sort of profited from that, uh, that little sort of ease up when UHC ran short. But uh, there you have it. You can see how easy it is to lose position like and sometimes it just you know it's i probably could have done something else there but like sometimes it's largely out of your control like, like especially just, when when there's so many corners um it just you can takes see the degree of difficulty up in the um yep and there's always a bit of unpredictability and you can see there um Polini was nowhere either there was a lot of people who just got completely shuffled and canola who was doing very well in other times he managed to get like seventh or something like that but basically that just was advantage the guys at the back because they just went woof and just came by with speed cool yep so uh thanks for watching there you have it so uh yeah keep uh keep watching the channel and we'll sort of keep posting things up and hopefully you can sort of get a bit of a feel for what it's like to be in there in the peloton cheers neil Thanks, Matt.